you are nowhere near your goal for muscularity. And at this stage in your lifting career, you should not be spending a meaningful amount of time cutting. I would even structure the Mount Rushmore so there's like creatine up top and then this like second row kind of show them behind the curtain and say a lot of the folks doing meta-analyses in this field do not know how to do them and are doing them very poorly. Okay, so I want to kick things off by talking about body recomposition. You've mentioned the larger the deficit gets, the more challenging it becomes to thread that needle and achieve appreciable increases in lean mass while you're achieving fat loss along the way. Can you talk through the thinking process, variables, and what questions an intermediate lifter might ask themselves if their goal is body recomp in as much detail as possible? Sure. Yeah. With, with body recomp, I, I think whenever that's the goal, you really have to ask yourself a number of questions about, is this really a viable strategy for me? And under what conditions would it be most viable, right? So uh, to discuss it as two extremes, right? Let's say that you are me in the summer of 2017, okay? So you are about to get your pro card in bodybuilding. Um, you're as lean as a human would ever want to be. You've been consistently resistance training for decades in a row, basically uninterrupted. The likelihood that with that level of muscularity and that level of leanness, that you're going to be able to do anything with your training and nutrition that allows you to simultaneously build muscle and lose fat is close to zero. Um, as a, a statistical aficionado, I never assign probabilities of literally zero, but that's about as close as you're going to get, right? Um, it, it's just not going to happen because when you're that lean, the body, uh, you know, you can look at a variety of different, you know, hormone cascades. You can look at the effect of, uh, you know, low energy signals throughout the body. You're just not in a position to build muscle unless you really tailor every little variable correctly. So the other end of the extreme is you're someone who hasn't been training very much, or maybe you, you've never lifted before. And let's say you're a male you are 40% body fat, for example, okay? So we might find that if we put you on a, a walking program, you might actually have some, some modest gains in lean body mass just from being more mobile and more active, and you're, you're very likely to lose weight along the way. So in that scenario, we really don't have to do anything super fancy or nuanced to facilitate body recomposition, which again is just simultaneously building muscle while losing fat. Uh, so those are the two extremes. And so when you're, when you're asking yourself, is, is body recomposition right for me versus trying to just focus on building muscle or losing fat one than the other, you know, you really have to think, what is my starting body fat level? What is my history of body fat? And what is my resistance training history? So if you believe that you could just hop on a training program right now and easily gain a few pounds of muscle, then that would say, okay, maybe we are a candidate. We've got a lot of room to go in terms of inducing hypertrophy, and we probably don't need to optimize every little variable to, to facilitate that process. Uh, same thing if you are someone who has plenty of body fat to lose and maybe, you know, you are at the highest body fat you've ever been at your whole life. That probably means you are in a state where you probably can achieve some early weight loss with a relatively low amount of friction compared to others. Now, I, I bring up weight history because it's not just total body fat percentage, right? So obviously, if someone's 7% body fat, probably not recomping. If they're 35% body fat, we probably have a good shot. But it does get a little bit more tricky when you consider somebody's history. So 18% body fat physiologically looks a lot different if that is just your very comfortable natural body fat level that you've been at your entire adult life versus if you started at 45% body fat and lost over 100 pounds to get down to 18% body fat, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very different physiological situation. So Ultimately, the two things you're trying to assess there in a high level of detail is what is my general potential right now for muscle growth? 
And what is my general potential right now for relatively frictionless fat loss? And if you have high potential for both, then you're probably an ideal candidate for body recomposition. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's very helpful. I think there's going to be a lot of people who are, um, you know, I'll kind of give you an example where maybe they've bulked to kind of that 18 to 20% range. Um, let's assume that they have not been overweight in the past and they're an intermediate lifter, but they have been progressing in the gym during kind of their bulking cycle. What questions should they ask themselves at that point when they've maybe reached the peak of their bulk at 18 to 20% of, you know, should I cut or is there an opportunity to, to recomp um, at this higher body fat? Yeah, I think ultimately, you know, the, the first set of questions just pertains to what are we trying to achieve here? Where are we trying to go? Right. So if that individual told me that their long term goal was to, uh, you know, have 17 more pounds of muscle than they do today, um, but end up at a, you know, regardless of what body fat they're trying to get to, what that tells me is you are nowhere near your goal for muscularity. And at this stage in your lifting career, you should not be spending a meaningful amount of time cutting. Uh, so maybe you do decide, okay, I'm kind of sick of bulking. Maybe my appetite is down to zero. I'm just tired of it. Then that would be a type of situation where you say, okay, well, maybe because of those practical considerations, we just try to maintain body weight, continue progressing in the gym. Maybe we do achieve some recomposition in that, in that scenario, but it's really difficult for me. You know, I'll, I'll talk to folks who, um, they want to be a bodybuilder, for example, you know, high level competitive bodybuilder. And we know that they need to gain 40, 50 pounds before they even think about doing a, a competition style cut to really do damage on stage and, and really threaten to win a show uh, at the level they want to compete at. It really doesn't make sense to start locking yourself into the cycle where you are really nervous about weight gain and you cut down to 7% body fat every year and a half, right? It's, it's just kind of getting in this cyclical process that's going to make it so you are delaying the time it takes to attain that level of muscularity that you're searching for. Um, another thing worth considering is for someone in this situation, that gets back to the other part of your first question, which is about the magnitude of the calorie deficit, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm bulking up in this situation. I'm an intermediate lifter. I've got, I still got plenty of gains on the table, but they're not beginner gains, right? I'm going to have to work for them. They're going to be incremental, not this rapid growth phase at the beginning of my career. It is very plausible to expect that that individual could achieve recomposition, even in a modest calorie deficit. Um, you know, because of the factors that we've discussed already, it, it's totally plausible, right? But, but there, the question is, how rapid are we inducing weight loss? Or what is the magnitude of this deficit? That's going to be a defining characteristic. You know, there's some meta regression papers suggesting that if you're in a deficit of over 500 calories per day, we would predict that you're probably going to be unsuccessful for gaining new fat free mass. I don't agree with a common interpretation of that as like a law of physics. Like some people took that meta regression finding and said, okay, 500 is the number. It's, I mean, we're talking about regression, it's estimation, there's confidence intervals, there's error of estimation. So let's, you know, contextualize that number. But generally speaking, I do think that number's in the right ballpark, which is what meta regression is for, right? So I do think that, you know, if, if you're talking about having a really modest deficit where you're just leaning out a little bit, maybe it's a 300, 400 calorie per day deficit, you know, maybe, maybe there is a chance that you're going to build some muscle along the way. But I, I would encourage people, if you're intentionally inducing a caloric deficit and you're in this situation where it's like, maybe I can recomp, maybe not. You, you kind of, uh, you view any muscle building that occurs during that phase as icing on the cake, right? You're going into an, a, into a deficit, which means we're prioritizing fat loss, at least on a theoretical level. If we're able to build muscle along the way, fantastic. If not, we kind of knew what we were signing up for when we decided to go into an energy deficit. But I would say, if you're thinking about recomping and you're not at that extreme, brand new lifter, plenty of body fat to lose, 
you know, outside of that scenario, if you're trying to recomp and you're inducing a calorie deficit, that's a thousand calories a day, 1200 calories per day. Um, I wouldn't say it will never happen, but you are seriously attenuating the rate and magnitude of fat-free mass gains uh, at that level of calorie deficit. And, and the reasoning is simple, right? So now at Duke, I spent half my time here in the evolutionary anthropology department, and we study bio, bioenergetics and energy expenditure through an evolutionary lens. Oh, that's cool. And when you look at building new lean mass, this is a very expensive process, energetically speaking, and it's of no use to the organism who is experiencing a shortfall of caloric resources to say, you know what I'm going to do is invest a lot of calories in building muscle. The process itself is expensive and then invest even more calories in maintaining that additional yeah. fat free mass from now until the end of time. Right. So that there, there's a reason that uh, we are fighting an uphill battle when trying to build muscle when there are limited caloric res uh, resources available. Okay. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Right. In terms of, I think a few things, uh, you know, the first thing that sticks out is like people love numbers. So let's not stick to that 500. It's kind of, it's a range, but being on the more moderate side of a calorie deficit, depending on your, your training age and your rate of progress in the gym are all things to kind of consider if you want to have the best shot of a successful recomp. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, and then what are some of the best ways to measure body composition outside of trying to measure body fat percentage directly? That's a great question. And I actually, for, for non-research purposes, I don't recommend body fat percentage measurement or more, more appropriately, I call it estimation, right? So um, if anything, my bias should be telling you absolutely measure your body fat. So the work I used to do when I was at UNC Chapel Hill, I had a whole research line where we did a ton of body composition assessment and and uh, all different types. So we would do uh, bioelectrical impedance, uh, you know, uh, spectroscopy versus analysis. So BIA versus BIS. We would do DEXA, BOD pod, underwater weighing, skinfold with calipers, skinfold with ultrasound. I mean, you name it, we would do it. And what was really illuminating is for certain little projects we were doing, we would bring someone in and measure essentially all of those on the same day, right? And, and it would be folks who maybe over the course of doing five or six different measurement uh, devices, their body fat would be somewhere between 24% and 34%. And they would say, but what's my body fat percentage? <laughs> and I would say, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, there's some of these that we can feel better about than others. And, you, you know, we do DEXA and say, you know, DEXA is pretty good, but it's not perfect. And then you kind of go down the line. DEXA was the kind of standalone device that we felt best about. Uh, but, but the, really, if you wanted to get a good body fat number, you would combine devices because they all have certain strengths and weaknesses. So, for example, you would take a bone density measurement from DEXA, right, or in a, in a bone content value from DEXA. That, that's its strong point. You would take, uh, you know, a body volume measurement from, uh, from BOD pod, from, from air yeah. displacement plethysmography. And then you would take a total body water number from bioelectrical impedance spectroscopy. And you kind of triangulate those into a four compartment model and say, we've taken the best of this, the best of that, the best of that. And that's kind of the gold standard if you want that number. But very few people have access to a laboratory that can give them a good four compartment model of body composition. Of course, I should say MRI is the best of the best. If you can get our MRI, by all means, go for it. I've never heard of a human being outside of a clinical study getting their body comp tested with MRI. So probably not going to happen. It's, it's such a wasteful thing to do when you think of all the things that MRI machine <laughs> could be doing when you're just trying to, you know, figure out if you finally got below 10% body fat, right? right. Um, that thing could be helping someone diagnose a tumor or a variety of different yeah. medical conditions. So, um, so what I encourage people to do instead is pick something practical that can be tracked longitudinally and ideally pick something that's actually relevant to what you care about, right? So for example, uh, skin fold calipers, um, you, you can find some out there that are reasonably affordable. I haven't checked what they go for these days, but I'm sure there's a, a lot of variance between the high end 
and the pretty cheap stuff. For this purpose, the pretty cheap stuff works. But let's say, for example, you're really interested in belly fat. You know, you're like, okay, I, I'm noticing in pictures that I have some belly fat. I really want to focus on that. Well, that's fine. Um, and two things you can do, you get a cheap tape measure and look at your waist circumference around, around the thickest part of your abdomen. And then you do a skin fold of, you know, right around the belly button. Um, and, you know, you can look up where exactly to pinch and how to pinch. There's a million YouTube videos. And what I would say is if you're really focused on belly fat, what the heck do you care about 38% body fat versus 34% body fat? That's, that has nothing to do. It's related, but not indicative of what your actual goal is. Waist, is. waist circumference is a better measurement for that person. Absolutely. Waist circumference. And if you wanted to get even more technical, like I said, you could get a caliper measure and, and then look in millimeters at how we're doing on the actual uh, thickness of that skin fold or that or that, you know, subcutaneous fat layer. And if you so if belly fat's the goal, circumference is plenty. And then if you wanted to do uh, a measurement like that, go ahead. Uh, if you're more interested in kind of a more whole body comprehensive approach, you can in introduce other circumferences and skin fold measurements. And the reason to do both comes into play if you're someone who's interested in muscularity and leanness, right? So for example, if you lose a bunch of weight, but you've been lifting really hard, it's possible that your arm circumference might not change. And you'd say, well, but wait a minute, I lost all that weight. And what's happening, obviously, is the fat thickness is decreasing, but the muscle thickness is increasing. So the circumference of the arm stays the same. Mm -hmm. So that's why it can be helpful if you're interested in building a muscular and lean physique. Instead of just focusing on circumferences, you look at the circumferences and the skin fold measure to look at, okay, if circumference hasn't changed and skin fold goes down, muscle growth has happened. Uh, on the other side, if circumference goes up, skin fold hasn't changed, I'm getting more muscular but I'm probably not losing a ton of fat, at least in that region, right? So those, those are kind of like the midway point between getting your body fat done and then just having some practical things in home that you can use. But more often than not, I tell people, if you're tracking your body weight, you're paying attention to how your clothing fits and you're keeping an eye on the mirror, if you triangulate those three things, most of the time, that's telling you exactly what you want to know. Yeah, I was just going to say, for me, clothing fit is actually something that I measure. I have like a t-shirt and I'm like, this t-shirt is the t-shirt. I like this t-shirt. And when the t-shirt doesn't fit, I kind of end my bulk as well. Yeah. Um, and then I think performance is also another thing that you can measure if you're progressing in the gym. Um, I think there's some benefits to that as well. I totally agree with one big caveat. Okay. okay. So uh, in general, especially if you're on a pretty typical resistance training program, most of your rep ranges are in the 6 to 12 to 20 range maybe per set, then yes, progress in the gym can be a, a helpful indicator, yeah. um, especially if you have a pretty static selection of exercises you like to do. The important thing is to remember that there is a massive neurological component to strength. Uh, and so sometimes what I'll see is people who were on a very hypertrophy focused program, a pretty generic uh, resistance training program, then they start doing a bunch of strength training, one rep max training. And they say, and I'm speaking about myself, by the way, I went through this phase in college where I said, who, how could I be getting fat? Look how much my deadlift is going up. I was just getting better at deadlifting, right? Because I was doing a lot of very strength focused training. So um, I thought that I was building a bunch of muscle because my strength kept going up, but it was really just a, a shift in my training approach. Is, that was Is this when you were uh, racing someone on the bodybuilding.com forums to a 500 pound squat? That No, this was before that. So this okay. was uh, when I was even a little bit more naive in terms of how this stuff works. Um, but yeah, I was... Uh, I was really trying to push for a uh, a deadlift of, I think I was going for three times my body weight. And, and that was a number that I was really excited about hitting. Um, and my, my deadlift was going up like crazy, but my weight was also going up uh, pretty precipitously as well, which is why I care because I was looking at the ratio and I was like, well, whatever, deadlift is going up so much. Clearly, I'm just adding slabs of muscle to my glutes and hamstrings and back and traps. In reality, there were two processes occurring in parallel. 
I was getting better at deadlifting, which is why that number was going up and I was gaining a bunch of fat. And it wasn't until my roommate sat me down and said, hey, dude, no one has the heart to tell you, but you look like you're getting really fat. And I was like, oh, OK, that's, that's a good friend. Yeah, I'm, I'm still <laughs> friends with him to this day. Uh, he, he's an awesome guy. And uh, he he sat me down and, and he said, hey, everyone's going along with this. But me, I, I'm not going to keep pretending that you're getting super jacked. You, you really got to go back to the drawing board here. And, I was and, like, okay. and you were like, I'm cultivating mass. Exactly. Yeah. In my mind, like I, I had like the inverse of body image issues. I had convinced myself like, well, I must be just as lean as I used to be. And I'm just huge now. Um, and, and my buddy was like, no, the the mirror is definitely lying to you in this case. All right. So I'm going to move topics here. So uh, I want to preface it by it's I understand it's hard to make a blanket statement on a topic like supplements. But what would be your Mount Rushmore? your top four supplements that you would generally recommend to an intermediate lifter who's trying to improve their body composition and their performance in the gym. Hmm. All right. Well, it starts out easy. The, the easy one is creatine. Uh, and I would even structure the Mount Rushmore. So there's like creatine up top and then this like second row of, of a few other presidents. It gets its, it gets its own like mountain. Ex yeah creatine is kind of the standalone supplement and there were hopes for a while for a while that beta alanine might be the next creatine um and it, it just didn't pan out so number one i would say creatine and then the other you know i, I would say there's a circumstantial uh justification to put protein in there protein is fantastic you want to get plenty of it and a lot of folks supplement with it because it's convenient or in some cases um especially like when meat prices really started to climb it was actually becoming a more economical way to get high protein intake um so i would say protein would be in there uh caffeine again is circumstantial i think if you train in the morning caffeine is great um but i also especially as I get older and wiser, I'm starting to question the trade-off of, for people who train in the evening, you know, the marginal benefit of pre-workout caffeine against the substantial detriment of potential sleep disruption. Um, but, but caffeine would have to be in there. And then the fourth one, this is where it gets really tough. Uh, I would almost rather just leave the four spot blank and hope yeah. a, a new present comes three. along. <laughs> like, yeah, let's maybe something new will come along. Um, but I, I think those three are are really the top. Um, and I don't know if I'd really put a fourth in there. That's fair. And I agree on the caffeine. So I train kind of in the morning and I have a strict 2 p.m. caffeine cutoff because I yeah. notice that even if I have that coffee at 3 p.m., like I can't sleep and my mind's just going at night. And then I try to trace back what happened. And it's always like that 3 or 4 p.m. coffee. So I'm like, I just have a strict time cut off. Yeah. And I mean, you'll see people who work a fairly typical nine to five schedule and it's like 4.45 in the afternoon and they're given a double scoop of pre-workout. And I'm just like, dude, you're going to be staring at the ceiling at midnight. You know, uh, and maybe not. There's a lot of variability. Like uh, back in the day, I co-authored uh, a textbook chapter about caffeine. And I kind of drew the short straw where I had to cover the topics about like caffeine metabolism and the interplay with genetics and caffeine metabolism. The reason it was the short straw is because this was probably in like 2014 or 2015 go look at all the papers you like about caffeine and genetics notice the dates the vast majority of them are after that <laughs> so i was like basically trying to piece together just the first basic foundations of this literature um and, and so like if i had written that chapter five years later it would have been the easiest thing in the world but um but yeah there, there's a lot of variability in how quickly people metabolize caffeine how much those wakefulness effects linger for hours afterwards so i'm not trying to convince everyone like if you have caffeine at three in the afternoon and you sleep like a baby i'm not going to try to convince you that you don't but you based on the data are certainly in the minority uh in that scenario great so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to throw out some quotes that you've said in the past uh, give me your first 
your first general take on it. So the first one is looking into the retraining and detraining literature. Once you have the confidence, I can get back at any time. It's great for your mental health. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I, I still very strongly believe that. Uh, but I would also put the caveat. It's also harder to convince yourself that the stakes are high in the short term. Uh, so there, it's a double-edged sword where you look at the retraining and detraining literature and you say, yeah, if I lose it all, I can get it all back. And I know how, because I've done it before. Uh, the downside is when you're like, okay, I really got to get it together and tighten up uh, and really kind of get my, my schedule and training back in order. It's a lot easier to say, well, if I do it in two months, I'll, I'll be just as fine in the long run. And so yeah. it, 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 it makes it so like when I was younger, I would delay medical care because I didn't want to miss workouts. Right. And like, that's a, that's a dumb thing that's driven by a misunderstanding that like, if I miss a couple workouts, my gains are trashed for in perpetuity. Yeah. Um, so there's a balance you need to reach where you understand it's better to be fit now than if you're going to get in shape, you might as well do it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a setback, you can recover. Okay. So the next one is probably the deepest quote you've ever said. It's uh, <laughs> bodybuilders don't give traps enough love. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe that's just me, but uh, I, I agree on that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember um, when I did my first bodybuilding show, my traps were kind of a standout muscle group for me. And they were almost like a liability because they made everything else look smaller in comparison. And, uh, and I think, you know, when, when people talk about the best bodybuilders ever, they always think about this kind of X frame, you know, wide shoulders, big quads, thin waist. Yeah. One thing about that X frame is that traps aren't even included in it. They're above the top of the X, right? Mm. So I think a lot of people view it as this nice ancillary muscle in bodybuilding. But if, if traps were given the respect that they're due, then Marcus Rule would have had a very different bodybuilding career career. And if you don't know who that is, I because do. it is, he is kind of getting in the, you know, it's kind of going a little bit back in the past for a lot of listeners, just Google Marcus rule, look at some pictures of him. Uh, he was a mountain of a man. I'll throw up a picture. Okay, perfect. Yeah. He's, you got to get the one from that one show where he just looked perfect that the, when they had like the really shadowy lighting on the stage. Um, I think it was maybe in 2002, but he just looked incredible. Awesome. Okay, so this quote is really long. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, we can't uncritically accept the results of meta-analysis at face value. Of course, I would agree in theory that meta-analysis belong at the top of the hierarchy of evidence. However, that placement is based on a number of very, very critical assumptions. The search identified of all the relevant studies, the authors weeded out the studies that shouldn't be included the individual studies were carried out and reported effectively, and an appropriate selection of outcomes was extract extracted from the studies. Effect sizes were calculated effectively, and the st statistical approach to the meta-analysis was appropriate. If one or more of these assumptions are violated, that place atop the hierarchy of evidence doesn't mean much anymore, and it's quite common to see one or more of those assumptions violated. Uh, yeah, I believe that quote even more today than when I said it. Um, I, um, I've got some projects going in the background where I'm trying to continue spreading the word. Uh, can, you, can you maybe talk through that and, and dumb it down to, uh, you know, maybe some of the listeners who are, you know, they, they hear evidence and they hear meta analysis and they just run with it a hundred percent. Yeah. So there's, a lot of different types of scientific evidence and it would be really exhausting if we had to somehow if we had no compass to help lead the direction of which types of evidence carry more weight than others and the hierarchy of evidence helps us kind of get our bearings and have a general framework for how these different types of evidence fit together so when you see studies that hit the popular press uh, about nutrition for example you've got a mouse study an observational study and a randomized controlled trial where they actually changed people's diets experimentally. Obviously, these are not the same. And the hierarchy of evidence tells us, okay, you know, 
we should probably put more emphasis on the randomized controlled trial than the mouse study or the observational study. Well, at the, ho the top of this hierarchy is meta-analysis and specifically meta-analyses that combine results from well-conducted randomized controlled trials. In a lot of fields, that is the best of the best type of, of evidence you can have. The problem is meta-analysis is not an indicator of quality. Meta-analysis is a technique. And just like yeah. any technique, it can be done really poorly or it can be done really well. And I think it's very surprising to people in certain fields when you kind of show them behind the curtain and say, a lot of the folks doing meta-analyses in this field do not know how to do them and are doing them very poorly. And since it's a field specific issue, what that also often means is the people reviewing those papers don't know how to discern a good meta-analysis from a bad one. And so the, the kind of simplified version is over the years of reviewing papers uh, in the mass research review, uh, which I write every month, I, ident I started to identify paper after paper after paper, all meta-analyses that had not just little errors where we're talking about, oh, you got the value to be 2.03 and I think it should be 2.01. We're talking about massive errors that actually radically change the interpretation of that body of literature. Um, and so that's kind of the, uh, the crusade that I've been on is to kind of raise awareness about this, uh, to educate people about how to tell a good meta-analysis from a bad one, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, there's nothing worse than wrong research that is blindly given a heightened sense of credibility. And so when you say, here's a meta-analysis, meta people say, oh, then it must be the upper echelon, top tier of evidence. But if it's done poorly, that's actually more harm than good. And do you think it's a competency issue or is it like an incentive drives behavior type of issue? Uh, I believe that it is both and that they're related. So I would say that those are correlated uh, causes because I think the incentive structure in the academic world is you have to publish and you have to publish a lot. And publishing in our field often requires data. And I think there are a lot of people who believe they need to publish at a rate that exceeds their ability to gather their own data in the laboratory. So in that scenario, your options are fall short of your objectives and goals as far as publishing volume or get into doing secondary analysis of other people's data, which is where meta-analysis would fall. So I think a lot of people, as they're trying to keep, keep up with this really blistering pace of publication that seems to be snowballing and getting quicker and quicker over time. As people try to keep up with that, I think they are feeling pulled toward these secondary analyses and meta-analyses, mm. despite the fact that they know deep down, I've not actually been trained to do this. I I'm not entirely sure I know how to do this, but it looks feasible and I think I can do it. Um, and Research is the one place, it's not the only place, but it is one key place where you want to have at least a little imposter syndrome, <laughs> like, like yeah. unbridled confidence, if it's not rooted in rational explanation, is not a helpful thing as a researcher, um, because you cannot, <coughs> you can't always trust that reviewers are going to catch every mistake you make before it gets out to the public. So. Yeah, there, there's not as much of a safety net when you're doing research, and you actually have to have enough rational self-doubt to keep yourself in check. And, and I think that's where some of these meta-analyses go astray. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I I find that really interesting because I had similar experiences with data research at Google, um, where even though it was like quantitative data, um, there was some clear behaviors that I think were incentive driven and also people rushing to meet deadlines and get projects approved. So um, that's probably a, a different world, but I think uh, some of the stuff you said you know, holds true there as well. 
Yeah. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I really like about my current uh, team of researchers that I work with is literally just the other day, I went to uh, someone in a senior level position that I work for. And I said, you know how I told you I'd have that analysis done? I don't. And I'm going to miss the deadline. Yeah. And it's because <laughs> I found a better way, a more insightful way, a more meaningful way to analyze this data, but I've never done it. And therefore, I've spent a lot of my time learning how to do it. And they said, excellent. Awesome. And when you're in that kind of environment, you know that doing good work is always valued over doing more work or faster work. And that usually means that you're on the right track and you have enough space to actually act upon that self-doubt and go through rigorous training, learning, testing, assessment, send it to a, a peer who's done it before and yeah. say, does this look right to you? So um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people are in uh, various environments, whether it's in academia or in industry, where it is just such a mad dash that it's like, the deadline is not movable. Do it as well as you can yeah. given the deadline versus do it appropriately and we'll get it when we get it. You know, yeah. and those are two radically different things. Absolutely. All right. So I want to move uh, directions here. So uh, something I have a lot of interest is goal setting and behavior change. And I think one thing you've spoken about is things like goal hierarchy. So superordinate, intermediate and subordinate goals. Can you explain this concept in the lens of weight loss as an example? Sure. Yeah. I think weight loss is really what got me into goal setting because a lot of people with weight loss, <coughs> they try to use the SMART goal paradigm. And ultimately, that ends up being a number and a date for the most part, saying, I want to lose this much weight by this date. And what we know about weight loss is that it's hard. And most people, if they do achieve the goal eventually, it usually takes longer than they thought. And so they're kind of opting into a framework that's setting them up for failure. Uh, there's no middle ground. You either succeed or fail. And uh, I, I think it's important to recognize SMART goals were not rooted in health behavior psychology. They were rooted in how to make employees reach yeah. deadlines on time, which, as we just discussed, is not always great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> so uh, with, with goal setting and behavior change, I kind of started digging into this literature more closely and looking at actual psychology derived, you know, you know, how do people who actually study health behavior psychology operationalize goal setting and, and what kind of models and paradigms do they use? And one of the really widely embraced paradigms is that of a goal hierarchy, which uh, involves typically three tiers of different goals. Um, and what's nice about it is it basically forms a, a big web of interrelated goals that feed into one another. And by giving yourself a web rather than a singular outcome, you increases the chance, you increase the chances of partial victories of some flexibility of adjusting certain goals without feeling like you failed and started over. Okay. So to put that into context, the superordinate goal is what anchors the whole goal hierarchy. And this is really more of a value statement than a goal. It's what is important to me? What do I prioritize? And essentially, what kind of person do I want to be? And that sounds pretty powerful because it is. The idea with a, a superordinate goal is that it is your, it is the thing you come back to when you feel totally unmoored and feel like you're failing and you're like, why are we doing this in the first place? So it's like it, and it's almost like identity based, if that makes sense. Absolutely, it, it should be very closely associated with your sense of self and your sense of not your current identity, but your idealized yeah. identity, who you want to be. Um, and so, for a lot of people, a superordinate goal might be something like, "I want to be a healthy, dependable person who's around for my kids as long as I can be." Yeah. Right, and and that's huge. Like you don't decide in six months that you no longer care about that goal, right? So that, that's why it's anchoring is because it is baked into who you genuinely strive to be in a long-term sense. So weight loss would then kind of be an intermediate goal that serves that, you know? And so you might find that in order to be this healthy, reliable, dependable person who's at their best and around for their family for many decades to come, 
you set intermediate goals like lose weight, be more physically active, uh, do a particular activity with the kids and the grandkids. You know, you might have this kind of diverse web of intermediate goals uh, that all feed into being healthy and robust and, you know, having the longevity to be around for your family. So it could be weight loss, physical activity, nutrition, sleep, all working their way up there. And for each intermediate goal, you're going to have subordinate goals. And those are the day-to-day things that end up looking a lot more like SMART goals. They are more specific, actionable. Three days a week, I'm going to do cardio for 30 minutes, right? That's, That's a subordinate goal. And what's really nice is that as you go down the hierarchy, the goals you start to see that they're actually more malleable than we usually treat them because we are contextualizing them in terms of the more important goals that they serve, right? So if I am going along and things are going okay, but I'm realizing this three times, 30 minutes a week, I I hate this. This isn't going well. Maybe you tweak that. You say, okay, we're going to do one 30-minute cardio session, two long walks per week, and resistance training twice. So you, you can move these things around without losing sight of the fact that if we have to tweak these little ones, who cares? The biggest thing is making sure that we are effectively serving the intermediate and the superordinate goals ultimately. So it gives people more uh, cognitive flexibility and it gets people out of the trap of framing their ultra specific goals as pass fail opportunities. Um, Mm. Because eventually, I mean, if you decide you're going to do 120 minutes a week of cardio and you set that at the age of 33, are you still going to be doing that at the age of 83? No. So someday you will fail or give up on that goal. And a goal hierarchy helps you kind of have more flexibility to say, that's no longer the best subordinate goal to actually feed into my hierarchy. And therefore I'll change it without feeling like I lost or pivoted, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I feel the challenge a lot of people have is some people, so the superordinate goal involves a lot of reflection and that's challenging Mm -hmm. for people. And then there's other people who they're good at that dreamy thing, but they're not good at the actual process, which is Mm -hmm. kind of those, those smaller, those intermediate goals or those subordinate goals. So you really need all of them. Yeah. 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 And and like you said, um, the superordinate goal, sometimes you ask someone to reflect on that and they find that their superordinate goal when they write it down on paper is very superficial or very trivial. And they go, wait a minute, what is that? And and like, it actually does like trigger this like really intense self-reflection of like, you'll come into people and they'll say like, I want to get fit more than anything. And then you ask them to, to make a goal hierarchy. And at the very top of their goal hierarchy is like, I'd love more attention on the dating scene. And, and it's like, well, wait a minute. That's, that's not a superordinate goal, right? Like a superordinate goal is like, I want to establish uh, a thing that brings me joy and fulfillment and that yeah. I can support and they can support. So you kind of have to help people restructure these things. And sometimes we actually find like the reason that you have struggled with your fitness goals in the past is because you haven't even really figured out what they're really serving yet. And it's difficult to cultivate sustaining, you know, sustainable long-term intrinsic motivation when you are ultimately directionless and getting a little bit more attention for dating. First of all, I hate to break it to everyone, but like just getting in shape isn't really going to revolutionize your, your dating life. Like work on your personality and get a haircut. Like there's lots of things you can yeah. do to help you. <laughs> there's a lot of things. And so I think um, sometimes w- when I notice that someone is really struggling with uh, following through on a fitness uh, trajectory and they try and try again and they keep failing uh, or falling short. I often find that it's uh, there are some massive gaps or some massive contradictions within their goal hierarchy, and they don't really discover that until they actually draw it out. And if we can't find a motivator to, to serve as a superordinate goal that actually relates directly to your fitness goals, then we're going to have some big challenges eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Um Yeah, I think that's great. And then another thing that I've done in the past, I don't know if there's any research because I've just done everything more kind of experience-based. It's kind of like 
visualization and some mental contrasting type stuff where I kind of imagine the goal being achieved and then I imagine the goal not being achieved and try to work backwards. Um, just curious your thoughts on that or if that's just my brain being fluffy. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, that that's definitely, um, th that can be a really helpful thing that inspires a lot of positive motivation, right? Where, where people start to say yeah, like, yeah, I, I actually can envision myself attaining this superordinate kind of longer term goal. And I can see why it means so much to me when I think through the the alternatives of, you know, what does life look like when I do it versus when I don't. So that that's definitely that kind of mental contrasting. There is uh, a lot of health behavior psychology research on it, and it does tend to be a helpful strategy. So what, what I really love about that literature is that you can kind of use that literature to traverse the entire goal hierarchy where there's like these almost like little tips and tricks for making the, the subordinate goals more attainable, like little tiny behavioral tweaks you can make that, that help support turning things into more like almost like automatic habits versus, you know, really uh, intentional goal directed behaviors. So you, you can look at some behavioral psychology strategies that work really low on the hierarchy Whereas I would say mental contrasting works a little bit higher on the hierarchy of, of kind of, you know, relinking you to that superordinate goal, which ultimately, you know, that whatever intrinsic motivation you cultivate from that exercise um, to, to, to borrow a political for, or a economic phrase, I think that really does trickle down the hierarchy. You know, it's. You I, just say trickle down? I, yeah, I did. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're getting into like 1980s economics theory. Uh, but but no, I, I think that when you can, re that's ultimately what the superordinate goal is there for, it is to help keep you tethered to this entire hierarchy and to keep you anchored. And sometimes you can kind of get so caught up in the day to day subordinate implementation aspects that you become uh, mentally and emotionally a little bit untethered from that superordinate goal that makes it all worthwhile. And I think mental contrasting can help recouple that and bring you back closer to like, hey, remember why we're really doing this and remember the the alternative of what happens if, if we don't follow through. Yeah, and I think it's really important to have all three and be clear on them because the reality is like we spend a lot longer pursuing our goals than experiencing the goal. And I really felt that kind of when the company got acquired by Google, like it was a really cool moment, but then it was kind of fleeting. And I remember kind of all the work that had to go into making it happen. And even just when you get, get some confirmation that you're moving towards your superordinate goal or that you've completed some of your smaller goals, like you got to embrace that journey. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even if you, if you chat with athletes, right, it's like you spend you know, I had a football coach who said, Hey, we're out here practicing six days a week. We have 10 games a season, 15, if we win the championship. Yeah. Right. So you better like the process here because you're spending a lot more time on the process than the actual fruits of that labor. And you can think of it almost in the, you know, in the sense of, you know, even at like, you know, professional athletes who say like, my dream is to be a champion. And it's like, yeah, you, you can win that championship and have that label as part of your kind of identity. It kind of puts it up in that superordinate category. Um, but at the end of the day, you're going to spend years and years and years, six, seven days a week working toward this thing. And the night you win that championship is going to be pure ecstasy, but that's going to fade after like four days. So so you really do have to, to kind of... Uh, remember that it, it's about the process and that identity more so than the actual like three day rush of celebrating a championship, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for myself, I realized at that time, like my superordinate goal was kind of tied to, uh, you know, that acquisition and achieving something. It's like that goal might've actually not been high enough because when mm -hmm. it was achieved, then there was nothing else to work towards. And there was a time in my life then where I felt a bit lost because that goal was achieved when it should have been something that, uh, was more longer lasting, even though it was a big goal, it could have been more longer lasting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, and th that's a perfect parallel to the example of the athlete. I mean, we see so often that when athletes retire, they struggle with identity and 
I, I think it's it's likely because all of their you know th- their superordinate goal is anchored to their athletic identity, much like your superordinate goal uh, at the time seemed to be anchored to this company. And it's like it was well, yeah. when the company gets acquired or when the professional athlete's uh, career ends. It's like, well, wait a minute. If there was nothing higher than that, then then this is over, <laughs> right? And so that's a problem. And it often does kind of. Uh, initiate a process of of exploration and self-growth and you know it, it is hard for for a lot of ath- you know when you're an athlete and you're in your 80s at the retirement home the fact that you were a really good athlete 55 years ago is a matter of trivia at that point right yeah. and so you really do have to recontextualize like okay what i thought was a superordinate goal i better hope it was an intermediate goal <laughs> um or it could have been a side quest. Like you might find that you really thought you were following the right path in life that was going to bring you fulfillment. And you're like, I don't see any way to tie this whole trajectory to what I actually want to be in the big picture. And that's okay. Um, but yeah, a lot of times uh, we delude ourselves into thinking we've got this really good superordinate goal and it's either not the right goal or it's definitely not superordinate. Yeah, I think that dating market is a good example. Okay, now you've gotten the date. What happens to that goal? Now you've gotten married. What happens to that goal? If yeah. your fitness journey was tied to that, what keeps you going? Yeah, yeah. And and um, and a lot of people, you know, do have to kind of wrestle with that and do a little bit of soul searching and figure out, okay, this wasn't about getting a date. What was it really about? You know, and... and I can't answer that. That answer is going to differ from person to person, but it's worth asking and worth really taking the time to contemplate. Awesome. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some uh, images on the screen. And for the first one here, it's a person. And uh, tell me what you learned from them. I'm going to butcher the name here. Uh, Thich Nhat Han. Yeah, Thich Nhat Han. Um, there was, uh, I, I started to realize during COVID that, uh, like during lockdowns, that a lot of my day-to-day happiness and contentedness was linked to a lot of external things that I no longer had access to, including going to the gym. Um, And so during lockdowns, I started to, I I found that to be a really illuminating observation that my happiness and just day-to-day contentedness was so linked to extrinsic factors that could be taken away from me at a moment's notice. And I said, that doesn't seem good. Uh, from a you know psychological perspective, and it kind of got me on this trajectory of studying Buddhism, and uh, I ultimately found that Thich Nhat Hanh, he's a uh, he passed away a couple years ago, but he was a, a really fantastic uh, Buddhist monk. Uh, really did a lot to popularize Buddhist ideas, especially in the Western world, and uh, yeah, I, I just felt that his books and his audio recordings really resonated with me. And I just learned a ton from him uh, and uh, ultimately ended up meeting for quite a long time weekly with a, a meditating group that really adhered to his kind of branch of, of Buddhist thought and, and uh, mindfulness meditation. So learned a ton from him and, uh, you know, still really um, lean on those lessons big time. That's great. Yeah. I've been meditating I'd say on and off for 20 years, sometimes more consistently than other times. Sometimes I'm better at meditating than other times. And uh, I heard you say something on the topic. It was like uh, sitting on a bank of a river, your thoughts are like little leaves that come floating by on the surface of the water. If you want to pick up a leaf and spend time with it, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, just let it pass by. And that is very accurate to me in terms of my meditation journey the thoughts are there you just kind of view them or let them go by yeah and i I wish i could attribute that metaphor effectively um it's probably something i learned from either Thich Nhat Han or karma yeshi rabge but uh either way i certainly didn't come up with that metaphor uh pretend like you did yeah i i wish (laughs) But um, yeah, sometimes, you know, with my simple mind, it helps to think through actual metaphors. And when I am meditating, I will literally envision myself sitting on the bank of a walk of water um, and thinking of the things as leaves going by. And what's really important about that is it gives you the autonomy to 
interrogate certain thoughts as they come across if you wish to, but you have to make the conscious decision to do that. And you also have the piece uh, of reminding yourself, if I do nothing about this thought, that's okay. Like it will pass. And I think um, people of my personality type uh, and many out there feel like when there's a problem in our life, we have to resolve it via labor and execution and planning. And, you know, it's like, we feel like we have to control every little thing that's going on in our life and fix every little problem. And sometimes you find that even if you did nothing, it'll probably resolve itself anyway. So uh, it, it can be a really helpful perspective. Absolutely. I tried to solve every problem so I can totally relate. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's great when you're solving problems, but then when, <laughs> when sometimes you're just like, all right, I just got to let this one go and let it play out. All right. Next one. What did you learn working with the Special Olympics for powerlifting? Yeah, I coached a Special Olympics team for like five or six years. Um, and I, I learned a ton. I mean, I became a much better coach. Like if you can teach powerlifting effectively within that really, really unique population, um, you just learn so many skills along the way when you're trying to coach up power lifters who have physical differences, um, cognitive differences. Uh, in some cases, athletes who are not communicative at all, not even with gestures and eye contact and things like that. So I learned a lot about coaching, but I also learned a lot about like what sport is all about because Special Olympics, a lot of our athletes in Special Olympics uh, their training is often their main, uh, social event of the week. Like, you know, they'll come out once or twice a week and train. Some of them live in, uh, group communities where they receive care. Uh, you know, what you find is that that life, uh, the, the life of many of our athletes uh, at certain periods of the week could be really restricted and really isolated. And that, uh, that training time was for many of them really the highlight of their week as a social event, not just as a, I'm going to try to increase my bench press. So I think it, it was a good reminder that you don't, when you interact with people throughout the day, sometimes you just got to focus on being there for them and trying to do what you can to um, lend a helping hand and, and pass the time more enjoyably. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, Ram Das is an, another, uh, you know, mindfulness and, and kind of Buddhism adjacent figure. And uh, his metaphor for life is that we're all just walking each other home. <laughs> so it, oh, okay. it's, it's more about focusing on the, the journey than the destination. And you're going to get home either way, but either enjoy it or you don't. You can make it a nice peaceful walk or, or you could power walk, but good luck. We're all getting there eventually. And uh, I think with uh, Special Olympics, it really emphasized that point that my goal there was not to make these athletes the strongest human beings on the planet. It was to give them my absolute best for a few hours a week and, and to try to make sure it was the highlight of their week and that more than anything, they had fun and, and found it to be a socially fulfilling event. I think that is such a great mindset. I have a friend who comes to mind that his goal is always to make sure that you have a good time. And he's really good at understanding what a good time is for a friend. And he will do different things for different friends based on their personality. And uh, everyone loves him. And it's not a surprise. Yeah, definitely. All right. We've been going a little bit deep. I'm going to go in a different direction to end things off here. So when I listen to the Iron Culture podcast, uh, Omar has like a million nicknames for you. Here are some of them. T-Nation, T-Rex, calls it Trex Lore and Trex Nation. Is there one that you love and is there one that you really dislike that he says? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I'm into it. I think um, you know, my last name is Trexler. The first four letters are T-Rex. And it just seems to be a thing among Americans and the English language that like, my father had a lot of nicknames growing up. My brother had a lot of nicknames, my, my older brother, and I did as well. And, and a lot of people have always called me Trex or T-Rex. Um, I, I used to joke um, in, in all the businesses I've been associated with, uh, 
I, I usually I keep to myself. I keep a pretty low profile. I, I don't engage as much as I ought to on social media. So I always have a much smaller following than my peers when I when I do business engagements. And so um, I, I always would joke about uh, the, the Trex Army and Trex Nation out there as if it was this massive, super uh, um, rabid base of support for me. But uh, but uh, I think Omar has really latched on to that and talked about <laughs> Trex Nation and the Trex Army. Um, but no, it's uh, I, I think the nicknames are fun. And uh, I, I think uh, they've always been... Uh, yeah, a kind of distinguishing characteristic that I've enjoyed. Yeah, he likes to talk about that in your time as a bouncer. That seems to come up quite often now. Yeah, it's very clear to me that he he loved the movie Roadhouse more than the typical person. And okay. so uh, I think the Roadhouse is that Patrick Swayze uh, movie where he was a bouncer. And so he's he's all about the very brief window in time where I did, in fact, uh, work security at a bar awesome that is hilarious awesome eric thanks so much for your time today i really appreciate it where can everyone find you uh me personally uh you can find me on instagram my handle's at trexler fitness i also have a twitter which is at eric trexler but i almost never tweet uh if you want to keep up with my work though the best place to do that is uh massresearchreview.com. It's a monthly research review where uh, every single month, the first of the month, we publish a big issue all about the newest science in fitness, health, et cetera. So every, every month I write a, at least a few articles about my favorite research of the month to, to basically uh, help you, you know, do everything between eat better, exercise more effectively, uh, I, I even focus on psychology and mindset stuff like we discussed today. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive monthly publication. Awesome. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.